So the next conversation, uh, led by Mark Lawrence and AFEM, is to try to find positive solutions to the problems that we've just heard about. So thank you, guys. Over to you, Mark. Cheers, Ben. Hi, everybody. So I think let's lift the mood a little bit. Um, clearly, I think we, it's an opportunity to, to fight for our right to party. I think um, we're seeing challenges across the world. We're seeing, we're seeing challenges for events, festivals, nightclubs, and we've amassed some great brains here to, to really talk about each individual territory within Asia Pacific, talk about the uniqueness of each one, and how we can make sure that we continue to survive and thrive. So can I just go from, from you, Murat, across in just a little moment to describe you, your role, and, and also the, the beauty of the region you represent? Um, as I mentioned in my talk, uh, I'm, I'm a DJ. Um, I don't DJ as much anymore because um, there's not that much work anymore. But um, I, uh, I book for a, a number of clubs. Um, the scene in Sydney, as I mentioned, has, has seen a massive downturn. Um, some of the things you mentioned, Mark, in your speech about um, harm minimisation. Um, I think the media, the media perception um, of what's been going on has been, has been a real problem for us. Um, just trying to overcome the prejudice, uh, just educating people. Also, the government, uh, I mean, they, that's, that's what they look at. They look at the media and they're, they're pushed by media to, you know, to, um, uh, to have, uh, to change things. So, you know, whenever they want to actually um, change their, their policy, they just look at, they literally look at what the media says and, and that's how they work. So, you know, for us, it's been a real learning process. It's, after our scene got decimated, we all thought, what, what are we going to do? Um, and now we've so slowly started establishing industry bodies and um, rebuilding from scratch. Um, and so that's where it's at for us at the moment. It's, it's no music, lots of uh, boring stuff. <laughs> <laughs> lots of politics. <laughs> lots of politics. Over to you. Um, hi, guys. I'm Raul. I run uh, uh, one of the partners for the Livescape Group. Uh, we have offices in Singapore and uh, Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. Uh, we do a number of things. Um, I guess one or two that you might be familiar with is we used to do Future Music Festival uh, Asia uh, out here for the last three years. And we, in Australia as well, we had some issues. Um, we do a festival called It's the Ship on a cruise liner, which just happened about two weeks ago. We go from Singapore to Langkawi back to Singapore. We run a couple club nights uh, around the region. Um, and yeah, we do a, a bunch of the bigger, I guess, pop, headline shows and stuff as well. So, so that's a survey in Livescape, yeah. Brilliant. Hey, uh, my name's Akshay Sareen, I'm from India, and um, I've been making music since I was 16, and I also run a couple of festivals, and I used to head culture marketing for Red Bull in India. So what I do is, I'm a creative person, but I also bridge between the left and right brain and get people from the creative world and the corporate world to work together. Uh, what I actually did this year was um, get away from the electronic music scene completely and do a family-friendly festival because I foresaw what, what you guys have been talking about, how saturation and the government are creating trouble. So this year we actually went all out and created a festival that like parents and their kids and everyone could come to. But the content was still, I mean, we still had like Daddy G from Massive Attack and we had Indian folk music sharing the same stage. Hi, I'm Ant Celestino, uh, head of A&R at One Love. Uh, filling in for Frank today, who's unwell, um, but has been a very big vocal proponent of these issues. Um, so I'm pretty across his point of view of things. Um, yeah, I've worked as an artist, a DJ, uh, producer, uh, now with labels. I've worked closely with Totem One Love Group for Stereosonic since inception uh, in their in our department bookings. Uh, and touring, and um, yeah, just, I mean, want to get involved in these issues more and, you know, keep the discussion going. Mm -hmm. So the good news is I can assure everyone it's not doom and gloom. Um, one of the things that we as an association were able to see very quickly this year was that there were unique challenges in most cities around the world affecting nightlife. But two cities stood out as kind of bucking the trend, which were Berlin and Amsterdam. And in Berlin, you have a well-established club commission, which very much is seen as a, a critical cog in the economy of Berlin. 
They have an amazing business and uh, an amazing uh, relationship with government and legislators. And you almost couldn't have a club like Burgard in any other city, and that's testament to, to the club commission. And equally, in Amsterdam, you have a role called the Mayor of the Night, which is a role that exists between uh, the nightlife community and, and the government as well. And again, they've been critical to 24-hour licensing and harm reduction. And London had seen some, some pretty similar issues of late. And as a result of joined up lobbying with Berlin and Amsterdam, we were able to get the London, uh, London Council to introduce a nighttime economy champion. So we're starting to see this kind of the counterculture to what's happening and the fight that, that electronic music always has, you know, the kind of the spirit that we have now, now respond in a, in a political and, and constructive way. But I'm fascinated by, by your response to seeing what was coming, which was to, to move into an area where families and other genres come together. Can you just give us a bit more insight into how you created that very diverse response to, to some of these challenges to pure electronic music? So uh, while we are talking about reg regional issues, I guess, as, as Murat mentioned earlier, it's more of a global issue, which is that, and I guess you could sort of refer to Isaac Newton's second law of motion, which is for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And what we need to do is look inward and see what have we done to actually perpetuate and create the resistance from the authorities. You know, I mean, let's face it, stereotypically speaking, the electronic music industry isn't known for the best of things. I mean, hedonism, intoxication are pretty much what the first thing that comes to mind. So, I mean, their governments are created for enforcement and making sure that things are socially useful and constructive. So, while we are pushing um, culture and the arts, what we should be doing is focusing on the image building, like you were saying earlier, the image building of what we're doing and how it actually adds value to society as a whole. It's not just about escape. I mean, it's escape, but it's about pushing the arts. And this is something that I saw happening in India very ra fairly rapidly, which was um, electronic music came in and then like massive festivals and massive growth. And as expected, as happened in the West, kids started dying. And I was like, I don't want to be part of this, you know? Like, I don't want to perpetuate something like this. I would rather create something that is all-encompassing and accessible to everyone and breaks the barriers to entry, you know, like you don't want the music to be tainted by the things that are happening on the side, so, which is why we took a conscious effort to like explain to the government, I mean, it was really tough for us because Skrillex performed a week before our festival and as most of you know, um, a, a girl passed away over there and we had such a tough time like running behind the ministers and everything, like saying, you know what, well, we are not this, we are for the family, you can bring your kids, you know, bring, bring your mom, bring, bring, bring your grandparents if you want, bring your picnic basket, have a good time, you know, like we want to create that culture where it's not like 10,000 kids high and jumping up and down, like, I mean, of course, there's a space for the kids to have a good time as well, but there's something, I mean, if you involve people and you bring them in and make it inclusive, then they know that, oh, this is what it's about, it's not just for the kids, it's not just for them, it's for everyone. Music is for everyone at the end of the day. And that was the, the logic behind it. Rahul, could you talk to us about Malaysia over the last few years? Because it, it's, it's faced some challenges. How have you responded? How important is, is clubbing to the scene? You know, just, just give us a, a sense of, of then and now. Ooh, okay, um, yeah, I mean, you know, KL, I, you know, I guess after uh, Future, we just, everything just kind of took a, took a turn. Every, every, you know, everybody was a lot more, uh, it, it's, it really is the authorities really, and we, we've always wanted to have an open communication with them and uh, try to, um, you know, kind of let them know about what we're doing. I mean, at every Livescape show, we put the highest regard for security, for medical. I mean, a lot of our plans um, that we did and we put out, um, the police themselves had never seen anything like it before. They're like, oh, okay, um, you know? so. so what we did was we tried to educate them, um, and you know, you, they really need to be responsive to it, they really need to accept it. We need to kind of, as a promoter, as an organizer, we really need to have more dialogues with them. But if they don't want to, and if they're not kind of, um, yeah, they're not keen to kind of make that, that step, as, you know, then, then we're kind of just stuck, really, as well. Did you, um 
uh, open the topic about drug testing with them at all? Because in Australia, that's a topical thing yeah, the, right the, at the, the moment. The thing about it is I think that with the culture in Malaysia, with Singapore um, as well, is that um, as much as we presented to them, well, so many different security plans and ideas and, you know, policing issues and stuff like that, you know, them, how they see it, I guess, is that if we're actually talking about drugs, if we're going to put big signs out in our front, which we offer to do on the big LED screen saying that, don't take this, don't, you know, they're like, yeah, right. on their mind is that oh, we're actually promoting it. Yeah, you know right. what I mean? So it's, it's just, it's like just pretend totally it's different, not there. totally different culture, totally yeah. different uh, mindset of how, how they approach it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, authority is aside, it's not really them as well, it's also the kids. I mean, you know, we have, you know, we're the first ones to have a roving medical team nonstop. We had a, wow, well, we had a full hospital really backstage at all these, uh, all the, all these shows that we do. Um, and we kind of set a new standard in terms of what needs to be done, really. Um, and, uh, yeah, like I said, a lot of them from then on realized that, okay, cool, you know, we know what we're doing. Uh, you know, we've had all this stuff in place. But just the, I think it's just the mindset. Even with the kids, when they go up there and, you know, we, if, you know, if we see somebody that's not feeling too well, we'll go up to them and say, hey, guys, um, we're just going to take you, we're going to give you some water, we're going to take care of you. You know, we have a whole team backstage and you know, all their friends would be, no, 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 don't touch my friend. Don't get away from it. Like, look, you know, we're, we're not the police. But, you know, it's the fear, I guess, also that they've kind of instilled in their minds saying that, you know. Yeah, you know I, what, that's just yeah, what the, I think. I think the important thread you said earlier on about accept is that what, what has to happen now is across the world, we have to acknowledge what happens, accept yeah. it, and then act on it and act positively. And, and I think all too often we see and hear stories of local authorities, governments putting their head in the sand. And, and that, that's causing issues. The head in the sand approach doesn't make anything go away. Exactly. Denial isn't a good strategy. Yeah, it kills people. Yeah, but you know, the th and, and that's the thing, and that's why the dialogues need to happen constantly. You know, we, we know the, all the plans, all this, you know, we we're actually advising them. And you know, the, the, the thing about it is that when we, when we go back to them, it's like, guys, you know, we're actually just promoters. I'm, I'm here to put on an amazing experience for, my, you know, for the punters. You know, a lot of these issues is something that we're advising you guys on, and we're happy to help. We've got some of the best uh, teams from across the world, from the biggest music festivals, uh, you know, head of security from whatever, Tomorrowland, all these big festivals coming out and just kind of flying them out into Malaysia to meet with the head of police, to meet with the medical teams, to meet with all the guys and saying, look, guys, we do stuff for about 100,000, 200,000 people campsites and everything, we're here to make sure that this event where we had about maybe 40,000 people runs smoothly and we can assure you this happens, but the communication needs to be there. There needs to be a constant kind of, um, yeah, dialogue really, yeah. yeah. And if I can bring you in, yeah. what's your perspective, what's your experience? Yeah, look, I, I think, you know, touching on both, on all these points is, you know, there's a big image problem um, with, as particularly in dance music, electronic, I mean, this this, these issues go across all music genres. You know, if you're, if you're a band, you don't have pubs to play in, to like hone your chops, to create fans. So there's a roll-on effect across our entire like musical culture, for especially Australia, where it's, which is a country that prides itself on our like musical diversity. Um, that's rapidly disappearing, um, which is a real issue. But going back to the, the, the problem of uh, image is we can't we can't we can advise government we can advise you know we can create groups to sort of advise on that sort of things but that's not going to really that's 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 reactionary it's always playing catch up advising about okay this has happened what do we do now I think like what needs to happen is um, promoters need to come together and start talking about what it is that they actually do how they run events um, because it's always if it's on the back foot of hey, we, we try as much as we can to, to prevent these things from happening, but they happen, you're always on the back foot. And I think if promoters can come together and actually change this, this perception of what it is that they do, because in Australia, the public look at promoters of dance events and they go, they're drug dealers, they're... Yeah. I mean, this is just the perception I'm talking about. They're drug dealers, they're, they're bikies, it's, you know, it's a criminal sort of thing. And I think um, they don't really... They're not seen in the same sort of light as promoters of you know, a film festival, for instance, which drive that point of like, this is what we do behind the scenes, this is how we create our events. So that sort of stuff needs to sort of come together 
Um, promoters need to back each other, stick up for each other. There's not a lot of that happening, unfortunately. Um, you know, and those sort of things really impact and can make positive um, statements about what, what we do as a scene and what we do as a culture. Um, so I would I definitely like to see the image problem of promoters being tackled and events, the way events are put on, being handled you know, in a better light. Just, just to add on from that, actually, um, in Malaysia, actually, we just started a promoter organization called Alive, uh, and that's A-L-I-F-E. Uh, all the key promoters, all the major promoters there, we've just kind of started this thing. We're probably a year now, or a year and a half now, and we're kind of a direct voice to the government. So, like you said, so of all, you know, if, if, for example, somebody's doing, um, I don't know, a big Tiesto show or Armin or whatever, we make sure that everybody agrees on the right steps on the security and, you know, the, you know so, so, yeah, exactly. We just, we just started out in Malaysia and um, hopefully it's a model that can work uh, everywhere yeah. else. I mean, the perception, I, I find the perception is everything in this. And so if you've got an area like King's Cross, which if you speak to anyone about King's Cross, the general perception for the last however many years is, oh, that's like a strip where there's clubs and there's like, you know, there, there's, there's strippers. And so it's hard to break that perception when someone comes along and says, hey, we need to clean this area up because it doesn't have that perception of diversity in the first place. People go, that area is like a bad area, you know? Whereas if there was some diversity happening in, in the space of venues and, and the things that are happening in that, in that area, it would be harder for them to attack to begin with. So. How important is, is the media to this situation? Because certainly the North American experience is that the headlines are made by sensational stories that without any basis in fact, and that ultimately become un, un, unhelpful. What's the media like in Australia towards nightlife and festivals? Just give us some insight. <laughs> I, think, um, I think they're completely ignorant, actually. Uh, popular media is... is I mean, it's not just media, but it's also uh, just general public, police, uh, and the government. Um, and I, I touched on it in my talk. Um, I think they're all very ignorant, and uh, having a lot of voices from a lot of heads doesn't work. Yeah. Um, the only time you ever get any momentum and a message across is having a collective voice. Um, and I think we're realising that um, in, in Sydney... Um, and there's been talk, I mean, we had the EMC conference last week uh, and there was an industry leaders breakfast where um, everyone unanimously agreed that we should, A, set up an industry body, uh, that was a no-brainer, and then, B, uh, commission a, a, a Price Waterhouse to actually do an industry report about our worth, yeah. um, which is, you know, something that companies like Google and, um, and that do all the time to you know, to establish the worth of an industry, take it to the government, and then they start listening. And they're like, oh, you guys aren't actually drug dealers. You're a legitimate industry yeah. that brings in, you know, $40 billion of revenue, which, which we exactly. do. So, but no one's telling the story. It's, well, like yeah, a, it's an invisible story, you know. We're just like disenfranchised, you know, nobody. You need to make the case that this is actually damaging culturally and financially. Yeah, economically, right. economically, this is an issue. That's right. Yeah. As soon as you tell them that it's going to affect their tourism, their hip pocket, they'll be like, fuck. Yeah, and I think we, to a degree, have to take some responsibility for the ignorance because the thing that we have failed to do as an industry is put facts and stats out into the media and say, actually, our, our incident rate of violence, our incident rate of illness, our incident rate of hospital transports is way underneath any That's genre right. of music. That's right. But the or one sport. or two... Tragic events that ha absolutely or yeah, sport the yeah. one or two tragic events stick out and become sensational But when we did a, a similar panel at EDM biz in Vegas We had the kind of the chief uh, doctor of Vegas said look you guys are amazing Not only do you have less hospital transports, but when we when we patch people up and send them back out They say thank you. I don't get that from Metallica fans. So so <laughs> we are we're in a you know, so We're in this situation where we kind of lose because we don't talk about the positives you know, and it's very easy after the first two keynotes for us to sort of spiral into a place. But, but in fact, we can control our own destiny here. That's right. And it's through unity and it's through working together. So have, uh, do you see it? So we're now in a situation where across the world we have an Australian response, a Malaysian response, an Indian response. And we're seeing this incredible response so quickly within, you know, 
within 12 months of issues happening, we now have kind of the, the heartfelt power of electronic music bringing everybody together. What else do we need to do? Think, looking, looking to India, what else can we do to be sort of positive masters of our destiny? I guess um, this would apply to Malaysia as well, is that as cultures, we're quite different from the origins of dance music. I mean, being Netherlands and Australia, the UK, as cultures, when you say, I'm going to go to a club, it's like, oh, like it's evil, you know, like you must be like a sinner and yeah, like influenced by the West. So like there's like so many um, different opinions on music per se. I mean, forget dance music, I mean even folk music or anything that comes from anywhere else. So it's taken such a long time for India to uh, embrace globalization and now we're at that point where it's one of the biggest markets, not just for dance music, but for music per se. I mean, everyone comes to India now as part of their glo global touring schedule. So there's two, two parts to it. One is the people who are bringing all these artists to India from abroad need to be respectful of Indian culture and where we're coming from. And also, there needs to be two-way traffic of information for the people who are based in India, the promoters based in India, and say, you know, like, this is what we did, did in the West when we started out, and this is, these are the things that you shouldn't be doing. And uh, basically, like, back to the... I, I feel like it's really unfortunate that there's, like, so, so many, like, incidences of, like, you know, like, I, f I feel like people aren't taking responsibility for alcohol consumption. No one's talking about it. So, uh, I mean, a couple of months back, I was de delivering a strategy workshop for Diageo, who owns pretty much every alcohol brand in the world. And so I did, like, I did this amazing workshop on culture marketing and experiential marketing. People were like, wow. And I made the mistake at the end of it, saying, like, hey, you guys are an alcohol company. You guys should take some responsibility and, like, communicate to people what it does to you. And, like, there was, like, pin drop silence and this, it was a really awkward moment. And I feel like more people need to do that. Yeah, it's just, just like, you know, we paid you to stand up there. What the fuck are you doing? And I feel like more people need to do that is like communicate more transparently and say, look, I mean, this is the product and this is what it does and consume it at your own, you know, your own discretion. And this actually stemmed from when I was doing a gig in, in Bangalore, like I think six years ago, and my vocalist kept saying, you know, guys, go to the bar, hit the bar. And my dad was at the gig and he came up to me at, at the end of the night and he's like, you know, you need to talk to your vocalist and tell her to stop doing that. And at that time, point in time, I was like, you know, dad, what do you know? And like a while later, I was like, you know, it kind of makes sense because we have a responsibility being up on stage or bringing the scene together. We have a responsibility to, to communicate to people, you know, and that's something very, very important, in, especially in Indian culture, because there's so much going against the scene. From, I mean, you guys are having trouble. Like, imagine yeah. what, what we go through. You know, like, the government's corrupt, and there's, like, <laughs> so much to, like, just... It's like an endless conversation, you know? I mean, I don't think this would be enough for it. But, the, but the, I mean, this <clears throat> becomes all the more critical when you look at how trends change, and, and we have this amazing tension you're touching on, which is the number of events that ultimately probably can't carry on without without brand money, and a lot of that brand money is drink money. So we have this, this alliance that needs to be maintained, but at the same time, many of the issues that are faced at the events are a result of alcohol consumption. So how do we, how, how do we manage that tension? And looking at, I mean, you know, particularly pertinent to Australia, how do we manage the tension between alcohol and nightlife? We, look, we, we don't have an issue with dance music in, in Australia. We have a, an issue with drinking with the way, we have an issue with the way people approach having a good time. You know, we have a culture where, you know, we have kids that are dropping dead because, you know, we don't look at them and say the person who is the biggest dickhead of the night, you know, who is just like the most drinking, the person that gets the most wasted, we don't look at them and say they need help. We look at them and go, what a legend, you know? And that's a, that's a cultural problem that needs to be... Am I right? Or yeah, right? it's, it's yeah, everywhere, it's man. Kind no, of it's, true. it's unfortunate, and like the victim here is basically our industry because it's easy to poke a finger and say, "Well, that it, that's the issue there," but it's not really yeah. the issue. The issue is that we can't, as a culture, address 
the fact that, and it comes back to this uneasy alliance that we have in this relationship with alcohol and, and the way we approach having a good time, a good night out. Um, and I think like we, we need to get on the front foot. We need to sort of start going, well, you, you know what, we can't rely on this. We need to work in with, with other bodies, with, you know, even with like alcohol lobbies, whatever, because this is going to affect them at the end of the day. If they don't have festivals, they don't have clubs to sell their wares, this is really going to hit them in the pocket. So we need to sort of start going, okay, we can work together with these guys to actually get some sort of education out there. Um, I mean, like at the moment, everyone's focusing on drug testing. That's not really going to be a solution to this. You know, just because you're going to have people testing pills doesn't mean that people are not going to go, great, this pill's safe, I'm going to have 20 of them. You know, like you, the issue is this binge mentality. Um, and we need to get on the front foot and work in with these, with these groups to actually change that. You know, otherwise... It, it's easy to point the finger at, well, they put the event on, it's their fault at the end of the day, and it's not really... And, and, and everyone's pointing at everybody else, right? Exactly. So, so it's our turn to kind of create the global voice yeah, for and, local and, flavors. and for the media, like a sensationalist media like we have in Australia, which is like real lowest common denominator yeah. stuff, and yeah. unfortunately our politicians make their policies based on headlines, yeah. you know, it's, it's not a good position it's to be in. It's a bad cycle. And mm. uh, just adding to that... Um, you know, I think that it comes back to perception again uh, because the drinking culture in Australia, um, it's okay if you're watching sport. Exactly. It's, it's totally cool. If you're watching a big sporting fixture and everyone's getting, you know, smashing heaps of booze, sweet. Melbourne Cup. Yeah, look, look it's at, all good. Look, look at images of Melbourne Cup after 6 p.m. Yeah, it's Melbourne like Cup. A fucking war Yeah, it's a huge, <laughs> you know, it's a big gambling fest and, and people booze up and... The media actually brags about how pissed people get at the races, and it's like at the this cricket, big and the cricket. Um, but when it's dance music, it's like, oh no, that's yeah. that's no good. And from an ecosystem perspective, why this is so important is we're getting hit where it hurts because if we don't protect the dance floor and make sure that the nightclubs thrive and survive, we're effectively killing off the youth team to keep the that's sporting right. analysis going. Because if you don't have dance floors, where do you have dance music? So this is critical now because if, you know, trends change, festivals could fade, that whole, that whole vibe could go. And if there's nowhere else to go, then we have an even bigger problem. We have a, bit, a big problem commercially, creatively. Uh, the core of our culture effectively is, is being challenged. So given how important it is to make sure that we have a thriving nightlife for the future DJs, promoters and managers, we have to commit to take action now. It has to be positive action. What, how do we... I mean, is it as simple as the fact that now we have all of these nightlife bodies either emerging or already there and established and joining the dots between them all and creating a global nightlife coalition? I think so. I think, it's, um, I think we need to stop being easy targets. Yeah. I think that's what we are. Um, we're just an easy target because um, we don't have a, a, you know, a structured um, sound um, you know, response when, when, we get, when we get... There's not um, one voice. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. It's not one voice, you know, so, um, and that's exactly right. That's, uh, I think funding is going to be very important. Um, you know, who's going to pay for these industry bodies? Um, where's the money going to come from? So, yeah, maybe th there should be some sort of, uh, you know, crowdfunding type thing where everyone puts money into it. So then, you know, like, you do need funds to make this stuff happen. Um, so it's got to come from somewhere. So, you know... Um, you should probably be the <laughs> instigator. I'm, I'm, I'm just so, so, so carefully trying to avoid saying by me. Um, <laughs> talk, to, yeah. talk, talk to me about a life as well. I mean, that's fascinating. Talk, yes. How's it constructed? How's it funded? What is it set up to do? So we're basically an uh, 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 organization for uh, key promoters out in Malaysia. And, uh, you know, there, there have been a few cancellations uh, in the last maybe year and a half or two, uh, which kind of um, ignited this... this uh, you know, this movement really. Um, my business partner over there, Iqbal, kind of um, is heading it right now with about maybe four or five other promoters, and we're trying to get as many more uh, key partners um, in, you know, in, involved. And what we're trying to do is, like what um, you mentioned just now, is have that conversation with, you know, all the key people putting on these big events and making sure that they're safe. And or kind of, in a way, just having like a standard, um, you know, Everything from maybe making sure that the ambulance route getting out of the venue is clear. There's no obstructions. We have, you know, if, if the Malaysian law says that you need five medics, we had, you know, 45, you know. 
and just going above and beyond to ensure that the experience and um, you know, we can, yeah, just the experience and the delivery of it is as safe as, you know, as, safe as we can kind of yeah. put it out to be. But then again, at the same time, not really jeopardizing the, the vibe of everything else as well, right? I mean, we do have obviously, the, you know, in Malaysia, it, it, it's a big sponsor market. So, um, you know, the beer boys and the, the liquor boys, I mean, they, they, they're one of our key partners in a lot of the big things that we do. Uh, and without them, or without obviously people like Tourism Malaysia, there's absolutely no way we can put on these, these big shows. Um, so it is, uh, you know, kind of maybe finding out, even like what you were talking about, like a global uh, way of kind of executing a lot of these big events just to make sure that there's just you know, in a way, a little bit safer. But at the same time, when you put all these rules, you put all these restrictions in, does it kind of affect the soul of what you're trying to put out? No, I it's just, know. it's basically just changing the mentality and yep. the perception of it being professional. Yeah. That's all it is. If you start putting videos out about this is how we deal, this is the ambulances, this is the, you know, yeah. the situations. If you can get on the front foot and put that out ahead of the, these things and have it unified then you're just dealing with it professionally. The perception can yep. change that because really we have that issue of it being a perception problem. And that becomes an easy target which, which feeds into that fear factor which these guys you know, in power can actually make ill-informed decisions based on. So 100% it's time to be stronger together. Yep. So your, think... your market's interesting on that perspective. You've got some strong players that we need to align, right? Yeah. So I think there's two, two components to this discussion. One is like educating people about how we're taking care of the back end of things and how safety is, is, is paramount. I think as an industry, what's happened is that we've sort of forgotten the power of music, just music itself. And I mean, if you trace back the origins of, of trans music in, in Africa and Asia, it was like a bunch of guys around a bonfire jumping up and down and guys playing the drums. So, I mean, the ayahuasca's, the BOT, all that stuff came along as an add-on, but it was always music that came first. And music has a power. I mean, if you do research, music has an energy, it's a vibration, and it affects all of us at a very primal level. And I think if we go back, so, so when I think of something like this and, and all of us coming together as a global industry, I always think of how, how do we want to communicate and how do we want to be seen. And I think this is the most important thing that we need to convey to people in the industry and outside is that music is an amazing thing. And you don't need all the extras, you know, like it's just the music and that's just should, it's good enough and it works. I mean, there's these guys in Argentina who um, hold these massive like 50,000 people events. It's called Yoga Rave, as cheesy as that sounds, but it works. I mean, they've got 50,000 people, no booze, no drugs, nothing just pure dance music and people are having the time of their lives. I mean, they played, played at Pasha in New York as well. And there is a way, you know, and people are doing it. And I think if we can actually step back, and this addresses the question of the brand partnerships as well, especially in a country like India where these alcohol brands aren't allowed to advertise on television, like they use music as surrogate marketing. This would m allow us to break free and do our own thing. Like I was speaking with, with Godwin earlier who, who owns a club in Singapore. And I was talking to him, like, who are the brands that you work with? And he's like, we do everything on our own. And that's the ideal situation is where you could actually make money from the people that care about you and are coming there voluntarily paying money to be part of something. And that's something that doesn't really exist in India. Like, if Bacardi did not sponsor XYZ event, people wouldn't come, man. They just wouldn't they'd be like, oh, cool, like another gig. You know, people don't care about the music enough. And I think that's what we need to do is actually get more people loyal about the scene and, and express to them that music is an amazing thing just on its own. It's funny, it's funny you said that, the Bacardi. I was actually just at uh, the NH7 yeah. thing in Pune yeah. and you know, we were on the way to the festival. I had the band on yeah. and nobody mentions, oh, you're going, nobody said, because I was saying, I'm going for the NH7 thing. Oh, what's that? Oh, you're going for the Bacardi thing. I yeah. was like, yeah. oh, wow, okay. It's so, uh, so it's ingrained so in them yeah, that so it's, it was like a Bacardi event rather yeah. than NH7, yeah. which is the music yeah. festival that and, it was, right? And the government doesn't allow these guys to market themselves. I mean, we are being used, it's a two-way street. I mean, we're, we're taking their money and doing stuff, but there is such a high price to pay on in the long run. But they did a really good job, though, the promoters, in terms of the drinking zones and, you know, different bands. Because it was, I think it was an all-ages thing, but then you had a different band to get yeah. into. Yeah, it's good. Very, very well done, actually. Coachella does it great. 
the drinking zones yeah. and you don't see any trouble out in the dance floor. Mm-hmm. People really stay in their zones. They don't, I mean, they pay so much money, they don't want to get thrown out. Yeah. It, <laughs> this, this point, though, about kind of making the music matter again, is that, is that a consistent experience for all of you that maybe because of the giant expansion in the scene, and as I alluded to in my keynote, you, you, there's a large population at the festivals that aren't necessarily there because they're lifelong fans of electronic music. They're part of the current, they've just arrived at the current scene. They're kind of, you know, daytime party is almost. They're there, they're there for the event. The rest of the time they listen to something else or do something else. Is that, is that part of the problem as well? I mean, if we look at of all the different things that are coming together to create the situation is is the fact that music doesn't matter one of them yeah i think it's a lot i think it's a problem i think uh edm is a little bit guilty of uh creating this whole um you know uh temporary sort of very short attention span type um experience <laughs> um and wowing people with lights and um you know, uh, cake, um, stuff like that, rather than... The image um, as well of being like a party on stage and... Yeah, you know, it's like, I mean, for me... Guys I, I, drinking bottles, you know. I, I come from like, a, you know, an underground, you know, tech, techno and house scene in Sydney. Uh, we, you know, when we opened our club, we, we, we didn't have any brand alliances or anything like that. Um, and we built our community f- one person at a time, literally from six people, um, Playing in a, and, and Matt was there, he's <laughs> sitting at the front. I remember him DJing there, and there was like 10 of us there, and we'd go there every Sunday morning, um, you know, at 4 a.m. Uh, we'd plug in all the system, and you know, there was no CDJs back then, and then six of us became 12, and 12 became 24, and soon we had 150, and then, you know, it was like 500, and then we opened a club, and there was this whole you know, and and it, that's the that's the beauty of what we do is it's you know it's it's real, it's organic, and when it grows like that, it's meaningful, and and you can't dispute that, and that's what we ha- I think we have to connect with and go back to. And it's like, and that's what happens in, you know, mature places like Berlin and Amsterdam. Like, you know, the the mayor of Berlin goes to Berghain. Do you know what I mean? I think that should be everybody's goal, is to get their mayor to go to an electronic club and hang out and have a drink. You know, that kind of, you know, forward-thinking politician is what we all need. It's the same in Amsterdam as well, I Yeah, that's right. And, you know, the risk of sounding like a politician, it sounds like we're saying we need to return to core values. But, but we actually think what's more than that is we almost need to step back and redefine them, because somewhere along the line we might have lost some. At the, at the risk of sounding like a kind of an old raver, peace, love, unity and respect were the core values yeah. 30 years ago. You almost need to apply that test to today because we've talked about the need for unity as an industry. We've talked about the need for respect as an industry. We did have it. The, the, one of the things is dance music's always felt very separate from the music industry. Um, and we're, like, there's been so many examples of big music events that have done such great live aid um you know band aid those sort of things where you have majors and you have managers and you have bands and artists all coming together for a cause um in australia we should be looking to tap into that we've got such incredible fan bases for huge acts that are domestic that if we can bring them together for some sort of event and then get dance inside of that you know not just as like we're going to put on a rave you know like rave your problems away if we put on like some sort of event that involves bands other styles of music makes it you know seem like we're part of a community because these issues do affect the wider music scene as well i mean th- this stuff affects a guys this stuff affects anyone from discovering that next talent um you know one of the one of like at murat's club you know i remember we were there one night claude von stroke was playing a 12-hour set and that night, you know, somewhere around six in the morning, we did one of our biggest artist signings for the year. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? If, the, if you take those moments away, like, thanks, Murat. If we take the, these moments away... <laughs> I'll like, invoice you later. Yeah. But if, if we take these moments away, like, how is the future of, like, any sort of music scene going to be, like, cultivated? So we need to join a wider body and just, sort of, like, not have that separation of, like, dance guys are doing this and it's a dance thing. We need to join forces with... with with the majors, you know, uh, managers, and, <laughs> and trying... No, because, like, it's going to affect their bottom line at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, we'll take some time to ask some questions, but maybe if we just go across with some closing points, what, what do you think the three critical things are that we do next? And I'll ask the same, the same for everyone. So Murat, 
benefit from you? The three, the three positive things that we do from today. I think um, the first one for me would be, uh, I mean, coming from a jaded sort of <laughs> uh, scene. <laughs> I mean, if I was coming from Amsterdam, I'd probably have a different um, point of view. But, uh, I mean, the first thing that I think, as I mentioned, is, uh, is solidarity uh, across, the, across the industry. Um, uh, collective voice um, type uh, type vibe um, image like trying to you know rebrand our image to the media and to government um, and using you know hard facts and numbers and, and telling them that we're a legitimate industry uh, and having you know and actually wooing them into um, you know into common sense really because as you can see we're all pretty you know normal looking people like we don't look like crazy drug dealers and grim reapers you know we're just regular guys that love music um, so you know that process of education uh, and third I think is um, I think for me personally as an artist and DJ and producer I think it's uh, important for people to, to connect with the culture of music of their music of what they identify with rather than as we said before, like just going to a festival and just becoming like one of the 100,000 people that go there with your mates because they think it's a good idea to get wasted and go there, like find your sound, follow your sound, buy the music from band camp or something. Make it it's special. Make it special and, and, you know, get back to the, to the, you know, the organic side of things. What are your three? Um, wow, well, okay. I may have to agree with you on that one. Um, I... On our side, I think in our markets, um, what we would like to see is a more open dialogue, as I mentioned before, with the government, uh, having them not really shy away and, you know, make, you know, oh, like, like what you guys were saying earlier, oh, you guys are, you know, organizing a dance music event, oh, shit, the, the devils are coming or whatever, you know, no, we're, uh, you know, we're, you know, a, a, uh, entity that brings substantial revenue to the country and I, I believe to tourism as well. Uh, we saw those numbers when we did Future. Uh, I think it was, what was it, 180 million ringgit to the economy that year, uh, just on one event. Um, but, you know, like, like yeah, we just want a clear, open dialogue with the governments. We want to make sure that we produce a safe uh, environment for all the patrons and stuff like that. That's on a business point of view, but I have to agree with what Murad said. We need, uh, you know, you, there has to be a local thriving scene as well where um, kids can go out and listen to a DJ play and get inspired by, you know, and, and then become a producer and then release stuff and then, you know, tour and, you know, tour the markets, tour the region and uh, build a business, really. Brilliant. You're three. I guess it's sort of a repetition, but... Um I think the global exchange of information and best practices, if you want to call them, and what works, what doesn't work, um, how to approach the government to get them on your side. And I think what I would really like to see is like a global campaign, like YouTube, social media, going back to what we were talking about earlier, like the peace, love, unity thing, because, you know, like respect the roots from where the music comes from and talk about that again and again. And not just as an outward facing thing, but something for all of us to actually believe in. Because only when you really believe it will people see the sincerity and the authenticity of what you're talking about. So promoters, artists really need to believe that there's very little scope for hypocrisy with something that's like, you have to practice what you preach. So you have to actually believe in what you're doing. And I think the third thing is that, and something that I'm very, very interested in is um, exploring new formats, which is like what I was talking about earlier, which is to focus on the music and, you know, as a pilot, just see if it actually works and it picks up traction because there is so much research on the actual psychological, physical effects music has on people and let's just work with creating a format that actually affects people in that way minus the other stuff. And that's something I'm working on in any case and I'm really keen on bringing it to the mainstream and seeing how people react to it. Because I think that it, that would do everything for us. It would just explain that, look, music's an amazing thing, and that's all that matters. Brilliant. And last, last from you. Yeah, I think um, what I'd like to see is, is support for creators. Like, I, I think, you know, when you have operators, promoters, you know, people that want to do things and they're being stopped from doing those things, I mean, that's like... That's insane, you know, like in, in our country, we pride ourselves on, on being people that help a mate, 
you know, and uh, we're, not, we're not seeing that. We're, we should be saying, okay, this guy wants to do something. He wants to create something. Let's fucking help him. You know, let's do whatever we can do to band together. And whether that comes from like an industry body that creates a fund or like looks for grants or whatever it is and say, okay, this guy is good at what he does. He knows how to put on events or he knows how to put on some sort of um, show. You know, how can we help this guy to do it? And how can we work around what we've currently got to turn it into a positive example of something being done well? You know, how can we support this guy to put on a day event? You know, to work around this and show that everyone, you know, that we're not going to be stopped by these sort of lockout laws or what yeah. have you, you know. So that's an important thing. And I think part of that comes back to, like, um, the right research being done and, you know, showing, like, you know, actually doing, making a business model about this and making a business case for why this is so important and then bringing in other industries, bringing in alcohol guys into it because it's going to affect them, bringing in all sorts of people into it working, changing the perception out there, working in even with the hospitals. We've got in Melbourne, you know, the, direct, the CEO of uh, our biggest hospitals calling for lockout laws because that's the solution for him, you know, because he's sick of seeing people coming in in the middle of the night, you know, for whatever yeah. reason. Um, you know, and then I think those things will help change the image. So, you know, ha working on that image, support and um, education. So before we go to questions, I guess if I can sum up, I think, I think our, our actions and our commitments are for industry unity, which means that we can then demonstrate our value and gain respect, and, and at the heart of that, returning to make sure the music matters. So let's, let, anyone got any questions for the, for the panel? Let's see if we can get some, some roving mics out there. I'll ask anything. We've got, we've got about eight minutes, so I can see Tommy's got his hand up. Get that man a mic. Hi, uh, Tommy D from, uh, well, I'm a DJ, but I also uh, have a whiskey company now called 808. You can out, try it out there. I'd just like to say, though, <laughs> a bit down on the, on the drinks industry. Uh, I, I'd like to say one thing, though, on, on, on that re respect, which is you're absolutely right. Absolutely right. I believe that the reason why I started my own drinks company was because I felt there wasn't a drinks company that actually had dance music in its soul. And because I come as a DJ and, and a music producer, I kind of felt I was maybe a little bit more uh, able to be able to bring that to the market. And, and one thing that we are trying to do with uh, 808 is to, obviously, the Drink Responsible campaign, which is fantastic. But we are trying to draw attention to the fact that people like to have a good time. They like to drink. They like to take drugs. What you've got to do is have a responsible attitude to that and how we get that across I feel having a, a, my company come through the actual dance music and be associated with dance music and have a real, have dance music at its soul is a way of doing that. And I'd like to, to, to make another point, which is we work very closely with the Nighttime Industries uh, Association in the UK, which ironically enough is only just been set up. Is that Alan the, Miller's that's game? That's Alan yeah. Miller's yeah. Uh, uh, um, thing. In fact, Alan's a, an investor in 808. And um, he, we work very closely with them because for exactly the same reason, that we feel that we're all in this together. And uh, I'm surprised it's taken so long for the UK to have one unified body. I totally agree with you, Murat. This is what you need to do, it's what everybody needs to do. Politicians listen to two things, the sound of voters not voting for them and the sound of money being paid. And, you know, if you've got a unified voice, uh, I found it in the music industry, uh, I'm a director of something called the Music Producers Guild. We're the only way that we got our, our point across the recording professionals across with the British government to talk about uh, uh, issues that revolve around, you know, um, the, the downloading, all that kind of stuff. It's the only way we will get our voice heard is to join together to create something very good, uh, you know, as Muret says, something very powerful, something they understand. They only listen to it one way. It's, it's pointless being in the corner shouting and going, waving your fingers. You've got to play their game. Thank you. Yeah, but you also need to make as much noise as you can. Like, we're, we're promoters, you know, whether you're an artist or you're a label or you're an event or whatever. We're in the business of making noise about what we're doing. You know, and we just need to change it from being about an event or being about an artist to just being about what we do, you know, fighting for what we do. Any more questions? Go on. God, they're all coming out. Yes, Wade. Hey, guys, what's up? 
I'm Wade from Pulse Radio. Um, I just wanted to kind of add something rather than ask you guys questions. Um, you touched on the, on the unity between the promoters, but I think one of the things that needs to happen is to change the message, um, especially within the mainstream media. You know, if you look at festivals, especially in Australia over the past two, three years, there's never a review. There's never a, a review on which act played well, which stage was busy, you know, anything about the, the event itself. It's always about how many people were arrested for drugs, how many people died. And I think um, once this promoter union has been formed, I mean, it's been talked about for a while now, um, I think what needs to happen is to infiltrate the mainstream media and actually educate them as to what really goes down. And, you know, maybe we have to bring them along and, and, and educate them. Well, you, you can do that, Wade. All right, I'm in. Yeah, you're on point. <laughs> you know, it's up to you to say, you know, this is what's happening. Don't focus on the negatives. Talk about what's amazing, you know. Get that out to your editors. Get that out to your writers. We've just started doing the same thing. So around the LA Task Force review, we've started seeding narrative into the North American press around because we've, 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 we've gone through kind of the first post, which is get the task force to recommend stays as over 18, no bans, and then we've, made, we've reinforced positive messages. So when it gets to the next stage for review by the supervisors, they're reading positive support for the decision rather than negative reports. And I think it's critical that we, we use our own media to start creating a sort of wall of positivity. Any, should we take a final question before, before we close? Anyone got any? One more? One more. No? Brilliant. Well, listen, thank you very much, gents, and uh, thank you very much for listening. Cheers.